Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. Rome, the Eternal City, had a peculiar war. With Italy as an Axis nation, it was a target for Allied bombers. But in the centre is the Vatican, home of the Pope, and a neutral state within the capital of a belligerent nation. In deference to the Pope, Allied bombing operations were curtailed, perhaps more than they might otherwise have been. When the Italians secretly brokered an armistice with the Allies, uh, and this was announced in September 1943, Rome was occupied by the Germans. With the Germans in charge, Italian men would be deported as forced labour, and the Jewish population of Rome rounded up to be sent to concentration camps. At the same time, the Vatican became a magnet for escaped prisoners of war who would seek refuge inside the walls of the Holy City. Now, I'm joined by Victor Filmesger. Victor is a retired US naval officer who served in Rome as the assistant naval attaché. He's also the author of Rome, City in Terror, the Nazi Occupation, 1943-44. But before we get to that, this podcast is brought to you by listeners like yourself who enjoy the show and help me find the time to put it together by becoming patrons and committing to pay a dollar or two each month via Patreon. Or even pushing the boat out to commit to a Rockefeller level of support like listener Christopher Strauss. Thank you, Christopher, for your support. You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Now, if, if Patreon is not your thing for whatever reason and you would like to join the gang, go to ww2podcast.com forward slash support and you'll find information on how to support the show via PayPal. Now, in doing so, if you check the box to be added to the mailing list, I will send you links to extras when I have them. So that's www.podcast.com forward slash support. Victor, thanks for joining me. Now, I wondered, um, let's start with before the Italian uh, armistice in September 43, when we have Mussolini in power, Italy is fighting with the Germans. How much of a target was Rome for those uh, for the Allies and the Allies uh, uh, Allied air forces? The issue was that uh, in the north of Italy, they were supplying an awful lot of uh, manufactured war material to the Germans. So they had a lot of, uh, of all of the factories were heavily engaged. And so the Allies, especially when they got into range from North Africa, started to bomb northern Italy. And the, the British actually, and I haven't, I haven't been able to get a, uh, a route how they did this, but they, they actually bombed Italy from, from England, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, after, after they took over in Tunisia, they, they started an effective bombing campaign against the Italian north. They didn't bomb Rome. And the reason is uh, they were afraid of the, the Pope. Uh, they were afraid of of angering Catholics in the occupied countries. That all changed with the invasion of Sicily, which took place on July 10th, 1940, uh, 1943. The Germans realized that uh, they needed to support their Italian Axis allies. And so they, they started to need, it started to need to send equipment and guns and tanks and, and troops into the southern part of the country. If you look at a map of Italy, you'll see that Rome is fairly close to the coast and in relatively flat terrain. What that meant is that all of the, all of the highways, all of the, uh, all of the railroad, railway facilities all had to go along the west coast of, of Italy, and Rome was the central point. So the decision was made while uh, uh, the battle in Sicily was going on that they needed to bomb the choke points in Rome and that they would only target the, uh, the rail yards uh, and uh, those big shipping yards where they, where they were holding things. Now, uh, that's all fine in theory. In fact, as the British and the Americans got together and, and made up a list of things that we will not not bomb, like the Vatican, uh, you know, uh, Santa Maria Maggiore, the places like that. But, you know, if you're dropping bombs from 20,000 feet, and remember, I'm a retired Navy officer, so I got in these discussions with my Air Force colleagues many times. Just because you drop a bomb doesn't mean it goes where you want it to. And from 20,000 feet, these bombs kind of went all over 
uh, all over the city. Now, they did do a pretty good job of destroying the, the targets, but they also killed thousands of people and wounded, uh, wounded thousands of others. So um, that was when Rome was first was first bombed, and it was to, to stop the flow of men and material towards the uh, uh, towards the south. Mm. You mentioned the Vatican there. You know that Vatican's sort of an oddity as far as it's it's a, a neutral state within, obviously a state that's belligerent. Is that a big problem for the Allies? I mean, presumably you've already mentioned the fact that uh, they're trying to avoid bombing it. Actually, it was a. It turned out to be a big benefit for the Allies because um, there was a Lateran Treaty in the 1920s that Mussolini signed with the Church. And and by the way, the church got about, I think it was eight hundred million dollars worth of Italian war bonds in exchange for uh, territory and and palaces and things throughout throughout Central Italy. The Vatican was totally uh, was totally independent, and what that meant was that you you had this little enclave in the center of the country that was able to uh, not only influence the Pope. Uh, and tell the Pope about what was going on through the war, but but also was a way that they could uh, uh, send and collect information on what was going on uh, with the with the Italians and with their their German allies. So, in that sense, it was a very very good thing. The two most important diplomats inside the Vatican were first uh, Sir Darcy Osborne who was the last Duke of Leeds, I might add. He, he didn't get that until after the war. He was a confidant of Pope Pius XI and Pope Pius XII. And he actually used to p- provide them with a transcript of the BBC broadcasts uh, during uh, every every morning after it came, I think it was an eight o'clock broadcast from London. And so he provided uh, the Pope with with news from the BBC it was forbidden by the fascist government to listen to uh, foreign radio stations. A lot of people did it, but they could be be thrown in jail and suffered big consequences. So, so Sir Darcy gave uh, gave the Pope a, a a list of what was what was going on and going on in the world. Uh, he was later joined by the American, who is one of my favorite fellows, Mr. Harold Tipman who fought with the 84th Aero Squadron in World War I and was severely, severely wounded. And uh, I go into some detail about that in, in the book, but the two of them became fast friends and, uh, and worked together on other projects, which I'm sure you're going to ask me about in a, in a minute. <laughs> well, well, when we get to the, let's get to those projects. Well, we say the Italian, this is where it gets slightly confusing because they don't, that there's not an armistice is the first the king deposes Mussolini, but the Italians remain in the war. That's that's how it works, isn't it, essentially? Yeah, that's how it worked. What happened was after Mussolini was meeting with Hitler up in northern Italy on the day that Rome got bombed, he came back and everybody was totally fed up with him. So he called what was, what was called the Fascist Grand Council. And the Grand Council had a vote, essentially a vote of no, no confidence. And uh, he said, well, I'll just ignore that. But the next day, the king called him over to his uh, his, his villa in a park in Rome and and uh, said uh, and fired him and didn't just fire him, but had him arrested. So he had to. So Mussolini had to uh, be interned. And uh, the king turned to Marshal Pietro Badoglio, who had been army chief of staff, and he had him form a government. Badoglio's an interesting fellow. He's the one that pushed to use poison gas against Ethiopian tribesmen uh, in the 1930s in the Ethiopian War. So he had 45 days in which to uh, run the country. And the first thing he did is said, don't worry, uh, Hitler, we're, we're in this with you to the end. And it was really kind of a wink, wink, nod, nod, because he sent all these frantic peace feelers out uh, primarily to the British via uh, Madrid and Lisbon and even even uh, Tangiers to try and try and get a, uh, an armistice done. Uh, so his government lasted 45 days until uh, uh, the Italians and, and the Allies signed a secret armistice in Tunisia. I think it was about the 3rd of September, if memory serves right. What the Italians wanted to do was to 
have the Allies attack, they would put up a brief non-consequential uh, fight. In Italian, it's called a bella fogora. <laughs> anyway, so that they they could say, see, we, we didn't desert you. And then they would uh, essentially go over to the Allies. What they were afraid of is what happened, is that the Germans would invade the country. And of course, uh, that's what they did. And I, I go through long things about moving, moving regiments and troops down and, and what have you. But uh, uh, finally, finally, uh, on the on the 9th of September, the Germans started to disband the Italian army. So many of them were were fed up that the, the Italian soldiers said, the war is over, we're out of here, and, and went home. And you really can't blame them after, after uh, all of these heavy losses. In many cases, their equipment was not so good. And, and the last thing they wanted to do was get, you know, be fighting the Germans and, and the Americans. So basically, the, uh, the, the Germans uh, disarmed them. And uh, it was at the same time that, that we, the Allies, primarily in this case, the Brits and the Americans, uh, landed at Salerno. It's a slightly bizarre situation where they find themselves in at war and then they're not at war, but they're, <laughs> they're, they're ex, they're, their last friends are now invading them, as it were, occupying the country. And presumably Rome's, the Germans must have, well, the Germans did occupy uh, Rome. What happens to Rome? Do the Germans see it as any as a as a strategic place to hold or do they feel it's more symbolic well it was symbolic and political more than anything else but it was strategic in the sense again we'll go back to this this choke point for supplies you know by this time by early september the germans had already left sicily they were slowly slowly marching up the peninsula uh to salerno and uh their plan was uh was to stop the Allies at every chance they could have, so they needed to have Rome come through. Uh, Badoglio had had uh, suggested that Rome be declared an all open city because of the church, the artworks, what have you. But if they declared it an open city, then the Germans would have had to say, "Well, we're not going to bring any equipment or or men through." Uh, and the Allies, being skeptics, thought they're not going to pay attention to that. And of course, they were right. And besides, if it had been an open city, the Allies thought, well, by the time by the time we take Rome, we're going to be needing to bring up men and materials from uh, from Naples uh, to do the same thing in reverse. It was really kind of a an amazing an amazing time. What do the Germans do with the Vatican? Because they've suddenly now, in you know, the Vatican is now surrounded by German occupied Rome. Uh, do they do they um, respect its uh, neutrality? You know that what's really strange is they did. They decided that uh, on several occasions that they were going to kidnap the Pope and uh, take him to uh, to southern Germany. There were plans. People drew up plans and things. It's it's unclear whether all of these were at the instigation of the Germans or whether there was an interesting British disinformation campaign of which you, you lot are excellent at to say that they were going to do that. But what immediately after the takeover of, of Rome, after the, the small battle of Rome, they painted a white line across the, uh, the Bernini col- uh, colonnade at, at the Vatican. And they had a couple of paratroopers there the whole time that Rome was occupied to, uh, to make sure that uh, people couldn't come in or, or couldn't come out. Not, normal people could go back and forth uh, as they wanted to back across this this uh, this border, but so the whole place was surrounded, and uh, and they didn't they the Germans did not enter uh, the Vatican except of course for their diplomats. Uh, soldiers were allowed to go to mass uh, inside the Vatican. Those those kinds of things. The other thing that's unique about Rome because of this treaty with Mussolini back in the twenties, there were places called extra extra territoriality. Uh, and these places meant that uh, the other basilicas like Santa Maria Maggiore, San, uh, San Polo Fuori Mure, these other places were treated like they were the Vatican, except they weren't, they didn't share common, common border with them. Now, these, uh, the Germans and especially the Italian fascists who uh, rose their ugly head again after, uh, after the, <laughs> uh, after the German takeover, these, uh, uh, they did go into, especially St. Paul's and St. John Lateran, uh, they did go into the basilicas and conduct raids looking for uh, escaped uh, military officers, Jews and, and partisans and 
politician. So you have this very, very unique situation going on inside the city of Rome. You mentioned the uh, fascist there. You know, uh, Italy had been a fascist state since the 20s. Uh, was there many willing in Rome to help the Germans? There was certainly fascists in Rome. A lot of people thoroughly bought into the whole Mussolini uh, thing. After uh, Mussolini was deposed, a lot of the fascists were thrown in jail inside Rome. And of course, when the Germans came in, they were released. Uh, these people were were very, very angry. And of course, they decided to work with the Germans. So they had a, a big core of people in the city that were willing to work uh, with the Germans. Uh, this is counterbalanced by by partisans, which I'm sure you'll want to talk about in a minute. But the vast majority of the people just kind of wanted all of this to, to be over with. How did the Germans treat the population? Because they had been allies, uh, you know, they could be classed as de you know, deserters, or they even could be classed as, you mentioned partisans, they could be classed as enemies. Did the Germans have any kind of official policy for uh, the population for Rome? Uh, of course, the, the fascists that, that came up, uh, you know, were well-treated and considered as, as colleagues. They were concerned about, uh, about the ordinary people of Rome working against them. As the nine months of German occupation went on, there became less and less food. And of course, people became more and more desperate. Uh, one of the things that the, uh, the, the fascists and the Germans did was to round up laborers for Germany. Germany had this insatiable appetite uh, for labor. And so they did what's called a rastelamento. They would block off several, several streets, go on tram cars, get all the men outside lined up, check documents, and anybody whose documents weren't perfect or was of the right age, they arrested and eventually sent them to Germany as workers. You know, if you were part of the part of the fascist fascist elite, uh, life in Rome was pretty good. The opera went on, uh, uh, restaurants were open, you know, without coupons. You know, the war profiteers made some money, but these people were really in the in the minority. The vast majority of Roman uh, Roman people were were not uh, were not involved in in helping the helping the fascists. And the other thing is, as as we allies moved up from southern Italy. It, it forced many, many Italians to leave the countryside and go to uh, go into Rome. In fact, uh, I think the population of Rome was thought to have doubled. I mean, there may have been as many as two million people, a million people living essentially illegally in Rome. I, I ran into a to a woman whose whose mother uh, lived in the in one of the the uh, street tunnels in Rome during the whole time. It was a great bomb shelter, and her family lived behind you know blankets strung up. Uh, waiting for the bombs to come, and I know exactly where, where, where this uh, this family lived. It's a place, you know, with with traffic underneath the Quirinale Palace. So there's still you know. a sizable Jewish population in Rome as well. That the, the uh, Italians had been uh, they hadn't really rounded the Jews up like the the Germans have been. They weren't quite as zealous. Um, yeah, and that's that's worth really talking about. So the Germans essentially controlled the city. If you look on the cover of the book, there's a German tank, although that's a little bit later. That's not quite at the same time. After they took over the city, within two weeks, Himmler said to his Gestapo key, uh, uh, chief, Herbert Kapler, he said, round up all the Jews and send them to Auschwitz. And so Kapler said, geez, you know, I've only been here two weeks. I've got people coming and I can't really do that. But what I will do is to give the Jews a false sense of security. And so he demanded 50 kilos of gold be delivered, quote unquote, for the German war effort from the Jews of Rome. So within uh, 36, 40 hours, something like that, the Jews of Rome were able to come up with 50 kilos of gold. And these were not from rich people. These were not gold bars. These these were wedding rings and, uh, you know, Star of David's, just kind of low, low gold jewelry that had to be assayed and stuff. And, and they came up with 50, 50 kilos. So they gave it to the Germans. It was sent sent to Berlin. The Jews all heaved this great sigh of relief. Oh, we've given them what they want. They'll leave us alone. Two days later, they came for the for the uh, uh, ancient libraries in the main synagogue of Rome. And this is important from a historical point of view because these were some of the oldest books uh, in the world. I want to 
just digress for a second, point out that the Jews have lived in Rome since before the time of Christ. So there have always been a large, small to medium to large uh, Jewish population in the city. So meanwhile, uh, uh, after the, as the libraries were being raided, uh, Hitler, Hitler, or Himmler rather, sent the, the guy from Paris, Daniker, who had rounded up French Jews, sent him to Rome because he was an expert on the, on the rounding up of people. And he, uh, he arranged to do a, a, a spread out all over the city to, uh, to bring in Jews one Saturday morning, October 16th. And he, he captured over 1,200 Jews and put them in, uh, in a place called the Military College, but only about a mile from the Vatican. Some of, some of these released if they were half Jews or, or proved not to be Jewish or what have you. But more than a thousand were put on trains, sent to Auschwitz, no water, no food, no nothing, and boxcars. There's a picture of one of the actual boxcars in the book. And uh, they ended up at, at uh, Auschwitz where Dr. Mengele uh, selected about 200 uh, for work and sent the other 800 and so to, uh, to be gassed that same day. Only 17 of these of these Jews that were rounded up that day uh, made it back to Rome. One woman, uh, 16 men. Could the Vatican do anything to intervene? Did they intervene? No. The, uh, the Pope was notified by a former student, uh, a woman, that the Jews had been uh, rounded up. It's very controversial. People have written books that the Pope uh, should have been able to intervene and, and, and stop this. I think the reader can pick which side he wants to come he or she wants to come down on that. He's surrounded by troops and Gestapo. They're threatening to send him to Germany to cut off all his communication with the rest of the world. I'm sure he felt a great deal of personal anguish for this, but I'm really not sure what he could do. I mean, he's got a Vatican police force. He can't march in against uh, German soldiers and, and, and free these people, I don't believe. Uh, logistically, that was just not possible. So, you know, this is the first of Many times when the Pope really dis, I believe disapproved of things, but there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot uh, a whole lot that he could do. Neutrality uh, is a very difficult tightrope to walk, depending on where you are uh, within the war's trajectory. Uh, you know, and if Germany is very much in the ascendancy, you kind of have to um, tow a line that uh, leans towards favorability to their side. Otherwise, you've had it. So you, there's there's uh, big roundups of men. Uh, the Jews are being rounded up. Is there much the the population of Rome can do? How do they react? Do they essentially all go into hiding? <laughs> uh, no, there was a, a, a perhaps small but very robust cadre of Romans who uh, decided that they needed to resist the Germans by any means possible. And there were there were two groups. When Badoglio and the king fled Rome, as the Germans were taking over, they left behind uh, quite a few military officers and also uh, people from the Carabinieri. And these people remained loyal to the king and the Badoglio government. And they immediately set up uh, uh, with getting clandestine radios, ways to send intelligence uh, down to the king and it was forward onto the allies. So they were a very strong uh, part of the opposition. The other, and perhaps uh, more well-known and, and in many ways better organized, were groups of partisans. There were something like 36 different partisan organizations in Rome that had as their task, self-appointed, that they were going to disrupt everything they possibly could against the Germans. One of the things is and they came from all levels of society and all political spectrums. There was a uh, even a, a committee of national li- liberation that was formed uh, and with six different political parties who all agreed to coordinate their their activities as far as doing sabotage against the Germans. The communists, because they had been organizing themselves as political political functions in, in Italy for you know 20 years before the war started, were perhaps the best organized. Uh, these were a lot of university uh, professors, associate professors, and idealistic students. They were very anti-fascist. And really at that time, the democracy of things in Italy were not that strong. So it got down to a choice. You were either a, you were either pretty much a, a fascist or you decided that you were going to be 
on the left and become either a, a socialist or a uh, communist. So these these people organized themselves into uh, uh, squadrons of action from about this time, November until the first of the year. There were the uh, there were seven major attacks against German forces throughout the city, and I'll I'll save for the reader to read about those. But Germans going into cinemas, uh, changing the guard at the prison, things like that. And so uh, there was this huge, huge resistance movement. But the partisans weren't, you know, they, they kind of divided themselves into different segments. There were those that were active, actively throwing hand grenades and, and assassinating people in the streets. There were those that uh, were helping by distributing newsletters, news sheets, uh, currying money around, currying supplies around. And then the the third group were those that just didn't, I think, as you Brits say, didn't want to didn't want to know about it. So if they saw something funny going on, they just turned and walked away and let the let the partisans go do this. So in in that sense, just about everybody in Rome would have come in contact with with these things and and reacted in in one of those three ways. And of course, everybody was by this point starving. So well, I'm right in saying it's it's due to partisan activity that bicycles get banned in Rome, which must be some some measure of their success when the everyday bicycle is banned. Well, first, well, what what happened was that it's rather difficult to go on a tram carrying bombs around with you. So, and and you needed to get away. Of course, the Germans had confiscated all cars and and trucks in the city. So, really, the only way to get around was a bicycle. So, if if you wanted to attack a German installation, whether it was a hotel, or what have you, um, you you got your pipe bomb or your hand grenade. And you shoved it in your coat pocket and you rode your bike and you saw a group of Germans and you threw the bomb. So first they said no bicycles after 5 5 p.m., 1,700 hours in the city. And then two days later, there was another one. And so they banned bicycles altogether throughout throughout the city, which led to some comical and absurd things. They were bicycles. They were not tricycles. So very often... Italian people, because they needed bikes to get around, would find a uh, uh, pram wheel and affixed it to the bicycle. So it technically was no longer a bicycle. It was a tricycle. And uh, they they went around in that. So they they tried not to lose their, their sense of humor, but, but uh, it was part of the German con- controls. One of the things that I found most remarkable was that, um, you know, you always think about, you, you see all the the movies and the Germans will get together and they'll haul people out on the street and then they'll they'll kill ten for one. You see this in every Greek village movie that you, that's ever happened. The Germans were still treating on the surface; they didn't really believe it. Still treating the Italians as an ally, and so they felt like that they couldn't do things. And they also wanted to pretend that Rome was the calm city; that there was nothing going on. Of course, everybody knew better than that. And so so they didn't do these reprisals. That is until March 23rd, when there was the largest attack in Rome. And it's very, very famous. It's Via Rosella. The long and short of it is that 335 Italian men and boys were assassinated and buried in caves just to the south of the city. And, uh, I, you know, I, I've actually walked the route that the uh, bombers took Timed it, uh, did that with my son and brother-in-law, and uh, we actually wanted to see how long it would take pushing a pushing a garbage cart with uh, with you know forty pounds of explosive in it up to, up to the place where the bomb went off, and so that that was kind of the last draw for the Germans, and they uh, they started that reprisal. That remains very controversial because some people said, well, if the partisans had only given themselves up, they wouldn't have had this reprisal. And I'll let the readers read the part in the book and uh, why I don't believe that that would have made any difference at all. And I've gotten into some discussions with Italian friends about that. So it's a, it is. I'm not quite sure how the Germ- the Germans quite work like that because the, you know it's it's not about actually getting the perpetrators; it's about sending a message. Uh, exactly, exactly. And the Germans understood that completely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now when. There's the Italian armistice. There's thousands of British prisoners of war in Italy. And, well, I don't know what, they escape, they just walk out. Some are sort of freed. How many of them find their way to Rome? Does Rome become a sort of a, a magnet for uh, 
POWs uh, on the run, I guess, from the Germans now. Well, what what happened on the day of the armistice, there were estimates that there were 70,000 Allied POWs. And I want to I want to emphasize that because there were, in addition to Brits, there were Kiwis, there were Australians, there were Palestinians uh, fighting for the Brits. There were French, uh, there were Poles, uh, there were a lot of Yugoslavs, and there were Americans, and they were all being held. Now, the vast majority were from the 8th Army in North Africa because of battles like Tobruk, where 30,000 Commonwealth, British and Commonwealth soldiers were, were captured, and they were all sent to Italy. And, and so when they invaded, Montgomery issued orders and said, you know, uh, these people are going to get in the way. We expect an, a quick, easy, easy trip up the uh, Italian peninsula. So we want them to kind of stay where they are because they'll get in the way. And, and really, they're not trained as uh, most of, a lot of these were air crews or support people. They, they weren't combat units. So he said everybody should stay in their prisoner of war camps and we'll be along shortly to, to see that you get home. Well, 50,000 of those POWs decided they've left the gates open. We're out of here. Most returned uh, to the camp shortly thereafter, but there were a vast number that were running around uh, Italy at that time and uh, looking to try and get as far south as they could to re- rejoin the Allies. Uh, and of course, a lot of part of the book talks about that and, and about how they escaped. And importantly, how the, the normal everyday Italian people risked their lives, literally, to hide these Allied soldiers. And what I found most poignant was uh, in working with uh, uh, children of these POWs is for years and years and years, British and Australian, especially uh, families, went back to Italy, found their the people that helped them. and. Uh, became quite quite good friends. And uh, that's absolutely amazing uh, to me that this this bond that was formed lasted. And I probably don't talk enough about that in the book, but it w- was certainly there. Well, it's quite striking in Rome when there's these POWs arriving in Rome, how uh, there's the escape lines, isn't it? It's organised by the uh, British uh, ambassador, Sadasi, how they're finding places for these men to hide in Italian citizens' houses, you know, they're not squirreling them away in, you know, out of the way. They're kind of almost hidden in plain sight and operating within uh, Italian society, which is remarkable. Well, it is. And and, and what happened is uh, as these soldiers left, somebody on the BBC or Radio London or someplace said that if you escape, you should make for allied countries such as Switzerland or perhaps the Vatican. Well, if you're 500 miles from Switzerland and 100 miles from the Vatican, where are you going to go? So what happened is uh, in drips and drabs, Allied soldiers made it to Vatican City and knocked on the door. Now, initially, they were like ones and twos. and There was even a prisoner of war exchange going on in the, the summer of 1943. But after the, after the armistice, they started showing up in larger groups, two, four, and one time... 16 or 20 showed up, all wanting asylum. Well, you can't maintain Vatican neutrality if you're holding, hiding allied allied soldiers. So basically, they uh, they had to say, look, we can't take any more. Eventually, there were 50 allied soldiers hiding inside the Vatican, but that was over the next, uh, the, the, the whole rest of the next year. So what happened is uh, several of the priests, an Irish priest named Monsignor O'Flaherty, and a Maltese priest, uh, actually brother, uh, called Brother Robert. They had friends. Uh, they both had uh, uh, strong connections to uh, to the Allies, and they said, "Right, we've got we've got these these two people, uh, these two soldiers. We need to hide them." And so it started out again onesies and twosies, and they started putting people. They went to Sir Darcy, and they told him what he was doing. And he says, "Oh, I can't get involved in this uh, because that would." neutrality. But if you'll go over there, you'll find some money. And so he started from his personal funds, uh, providing for all of us, uh, providing money uh, to feed, clothes, house, pay rent, while the priests were, were sending people around in the city to, to hide out in 
hideout with families, essentially. Eventually, Sir Darcy, and this is also incredible to believe, was given home leave in the middle of all of this to go back to England. He was then he was knighted by the king, and probably, although I can't definitively find this because I haven't found notes of the meeting, but was briefed on MI9. MI9 was the the uh, uh, British prisoner of war and escape service, and so when he when he came back. It was arranged for money to go through the Vatican Bank, you know, for diplomatic purposes. And uh, so he had money. What he didn't have, he, he was very uncomfortable with priests being the figureheads organizing all this. So he, he kind of became on the lookout for British uh, officers to run the, run the program. And, and, you know, I go into detail on that. Anybody who was British living inside, married to Italians or widows or widowers, ended up helping uh, hide one or two allies. Now, they really didn't want to keep people in Rome because it was expensive to feed. They were expensive to feed and and really hard to hide. Remember, I said there were like a million refugees in the city, so it was very difficult. And and finding places, and people would show up kind of on the Vatican and said, I'm here. And they said, oh, God, we got to hide them. So, so they actually rented a couple of apartments. One was called the Madhouse, where they where they uh, would would stash these uh, these soldiers, but it was really cheaper to get them out in the countryside. And uh, a lot of Italians, especially those that were in a position to help, had country connections. So uh, either either in villages or summer summer places, things like that. And they sent these uh, they sent these soldiers to live out there, and we kept in communication with them and and made sure that they had food and food and clothing and and resources, you know, sometimes they would get rid of 10 or 10 or 20 soldiers in one day and they'd have 30 show up. So it was just, so when you say how many were in Rome, I can say between 80 and 120, uh, depending upon what day. But the other thing, the other thing is this escape line uh, extended itself all over occupied German occupied Italy. So at the end, the numbers vary, but there were at least 4,000 allied soldiers and, you know, they, like I said, they, these were people from, uh, you know, these were black Africans. They were uh, people that were uh, Muslims from the Middle East. They're, of course, Indian soldiers. Uh, you know, you can, you can imagine these diverse races at this time trying to, trying to hide among Italians. I mean, they just, in 1943-44, they just weren't that many black people in Italy. They just weren't. Uh, there's an amusing story about one brother, brother Robert bringing a, a, a black, uh, a black uh, soldier into the city and dressed him in a cassock. And he said, you're with, you're from the Ethiopian college. And, and it worked, you know, but you, you can do that kind of thing onesies and twosies, but you can't do that when you have so many people coming in. What amused me was the guys who would cash checks uh, in their banks, so their family would notice there's a, been a you know a transaction, and then they would then know in you know in, in say to Chicago, I can't go recall where they were cashed. You, know, uh, uh, you said you lived in London, so maybe you know Palmer's Green. I actually have friends that live <laughs> on Palmer's Green, and 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 one fellow uh, desperately wanted to tell his wife that he was alive and on the run, so he arranged with Sir Darcy's uh, butler to uh, cash a check on his Palmer's green account. And, you know, back then you didn't have printed checks. You, you, you know, any check would do. You just wrote in your, your bank information. And so imagine this woman's surprise when she got called to see the bank manager in Palmer's green and said, is this your husband's signature? And she said, yes, well, he's alive and on the run in Rome. So uh, there were a couple of instances of, of that that were quite, quite amazing. Yeah. Now, uh, Himmler, uh, did he describe Rome as a nest? No, the Vatican as a nest of spies, um, and the American and the Americans, the, the OSS are operating there as well, aren't they? From are they operating from Rome or from the Vatican? Yeah, the o, the OSS uh, was a remarkable fellow by the name of uh, Peter Tompkins, who was twenty three years old and was just absolutely incredible. And uh, he organized with the partisans of all different. He says, "I don't care what politics you're in. We need to find out what the Germans are." Are sending through the city. So as far as uh, uh, guns, weapons, material, things like that. And he was doing sometimes as many as twice daily reports of troop movements going 
uh, going to, by this time, we've had Anzio and going to the uh, front at Anzio, as well as uh, further south near Monte Cassino. So he actually provided information that, that mentioned a, a big uh, a big push that the Germans were going to make in February uh, against it. And uh, uh, actually, uh, actions were taken to, to stop that attack. There's a personal connection here because my uncle was in Anzio. He's a company commander with a tank destroyer battalion. So that's how I got kind of started in a lot of this because he was the beneficiary of this information about an attack coming on, on Anzio. So, so it was in that sense, a, a nest of spies. The, uh, the, the Vatican uh, diplomats, uh, Sir Darcy and Mr. Tittman were scrupulous about not sending intelligence reports because again, it would hurt Vatican neutrality. So uh, they hooked up with uh, Italian military officers with OSS and, and other, other groups to get, get word out uh to the, to the allies, so so they were facilitating a lot of this kind of information flowing. So, in in many senses, the Germans were right; it was a nest of spies. But the Germans also had their own vipers inside the Vatican, reporting on uh, diplomat activities and trying to figure out what the Pope was going to do next, and all this kind of stuff. So it gets to be. Uh, I have a friend of mine that that I was stationed in Rome with, and he says it gets to be a spy novel at sometimes with all these these people going back and forth, but... Uh, well, the Vatican's uh, tiny as well. The Vatican City really isn't very big. No, oh, it's 105 yeah. acres. Yeah, yeah. Hundred, I, I don't know what that is in square kilometers. Or... They're kind of all on top of one another, uh, looking over each other's shoulders. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's why it was kind of amazing that, that there were 50 POWs living in there, and, and the, the diplomats were were living in, in apartments, they were they were South Americans. You know, we always forget about World War II that there were a lot of South Americans that that fought with the Allies, you know, Brazilians. Uh, you know, and and uh, that's why I'm doing another book on on all that. But but uh, so all these people had to be interned uh, inside the Vatican. Of course, they all had to be fed and housed and and closed and uh, clothed rather and all that that kind of stuff. So you know, there was a lot there was a lot going on inside the Vatican while trying to retain this uh, aloofness and neutrality and trying not to say anything that would honk anybody, especially Germans off, because they really could have just rolled tanks right into St. Peter's Square and, or worse, sealed everything off. You know, it's, it's, it's dependent upon water, electricity, gas, all of those city services, and they all could have just been shut off, you know, and there would have been thousands of people left inside uh, the Vatican without without any uh, mm. any resource. Mm. Now, you mentioned Anzio. Uh, that's, what, 30 to 40 miles from Rome? More, yeah, 30, 40 kilometers, really. It's not that far. Kilometers, even closer. Yeah. Even closer. So how, how do those landings affect the city? Because the fighting's suddenly very close. What had happened is that the day or two before, the Germans had stopped patrols along the anzio Natuno. Uh, it's kind of twin cities, like, you can walk from one to the other in 20 minutes. And so they'd stopped those patrols. And so the Allies had picked a great place to, to land. And uh, they got in there. And the first uh, 12, 14, 24 hours, it was a piece of cake. They uh, <clears throat> they weren't counterattacked particularly. There was some minor resistance. My uncle writes about that in letters to my grandmother, as did so many others. The Germans reacted very swiftly, much swifter than uh, we could possibly think. They cleaned out the, the hospitals, anybody that could pretty much stand. They cleaned out the VD clinic. You know, it was a big problem. Uh, and, and marched everybody down, and they did this ragtag assemble of units down there. And within 24, 48 hours, uh, they pretty much had the uh, allies blocked in. Of course, they tried to break out a couple of times, but but weren't real weren't real successful. The, the dilemma for the people running the escape line in Rome was, Wow, the Allies are here. They're so close. Maybe we should just let everybody walk to the sound of the guns and rejoin their units. And then they thought, well, you know what? They're so close. They'll be here in two or three days. Two or three days from the 22nd of January to June 4th. You, you can count and figure that out. You know, they, they often wonder, wondered what was going to happen. A few apparently did, uh, ex POWs did manage to rejoin at that time. But but the the Germans quickly tightened 
tightened the noose around Anzio and didn't let uh, didn't let people out. Did that effectively directly affect life in Rome, or did Rome just become a massive military transit camp of, with Germans passing through? Well, of course, with with Anzio, much more supplies came in, and more and more uh, things went went uh, went through the city. The partisans redoubled their efforts about about identifying uh, what was coming through the city uh, when they they saw supplies and tanks on on boxcars, uh, or rather on flat cars. Uh, you know, they actually were responsible for a couple couple of bombing raids that blew up some of this equipment. As the 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 biggest thing for the uh, for the people of Rome was that there was no food from the countryside. I mean, there hadn't been any coming up from the south for a long time, so food was very very scarce. They knew that the Allies were there. Of course, they kept saying, "When are you coming?" They started putting up graffiti: "Hang on, Allies, we'll be there soon to to rescue you." They also knew that that when American cigarettes started to show up in the city, that how close they were, and also sea ration uh, became available on the on the bulk market. So you know, at Anzio, the the frontier of the battle was shifting and so you you leave your sea ration containers behind and and the germans get those and what they didn't eat they they sent to rome to to sell yeah i mean and so there was but it was this this horrible waiting when will they get here when will they get here hitler's you you know, he's notorious for his uh hold all costs um did he issue any orders for rome to be held or destroyed or well that's that's kind of that's kind of fascinating um there was a lot. There was a lot of fear, both among the Germans and the and the Americans and British, that it was going to turn into another Stalingrad, and that the city would be wiped off the face of the earth, uh, and there would be hundreds of thousands of refugees running around that would totally disrupt any type of military actions going on. Believe it or not, the the Hitler Hitler was still concerned about German Catholics. I mean, there's like there was something like two million German Catholics in Bavaria alone. So there was a large segment, and then also in some of the uh, the occupied Allied countries, uh, had a lot of Catholics. And so anything that was going to happen uh, to the Pope was going to create was going to create uh, big problems. Eventually, I think someone appealed to the artist in Hitler and said, "Look, we it's of no strategic value. Let's do some delaying things and." Let's go. They did mine all of the bridges in the city as they left. The partisan, partisans went right behind them and snipped the wires and, and removed the explosives. That's how sophisticated these partisans came uh, as far as uh, being able to be a kind of a paramilitary organization. So that's kind of what happened. They uh, went out of the city, long lines. Uh, as they got north of the city, just, just outside the borders, uh, allied planes from from Anzio and those from uh, Sardinia bombed and strafed the roads of the Germans going out of the city. Well, that's, that's a horrific, that's a horrific thing. That's happened several times. I, I remember uh, I was on active, active duty in the Navy when, when we bombed uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's troops going out of Kuwait, the same kind of thing, uh, the same kind of pictures, perhaps uh, maybe on a slightly smaller scale, but it wasn't an easy, they just, got up and left, but they got up and left. Now, Rome is single-handedly uh, liberated, isn't it, by a sergeant, uh, is it Phelan? How, how does he manage to single-handedly oh, liberate? Oh, you mean the Vatican? Yeah. Oh, he was, uh, uh, y- yes, really liberated. I knew Staff Sergeant Phelan. Uh, he was the only one from the 601st Tank Destroyer Battalion that I, I knew from my uh, research. He was wounded at Anzio and it was sent to Naples where he recuperated. Right about the time Rome was, the battle for Rome was beginning in the third or so of June, he, he managed to hitch a ride back to his unit. And uh, because he was a staff sergeant, he said, uh, where's, I need to find my company. And they said, all right, staff sergeant, here, here's the keys, here's the Jeep. Uh, they're up there someplace. So he's alone. He gets in the Jeep and he starts heading north. And pretty soon he's in the outskirts of the city and it's, you know, dark, five o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. And he's driving around and he can't find anybody, doesn't hear any shooting or anything. And he ends up in St. Peter's Square. 
And he says, wow, I'm in St. Peter's Square. You know, if I'm going to see what the inside of St. Peter's looks like, I better do this right now. So he jumped out of the Jeep, ran up the steps, went in, had a quick look around the St. Peter's Square, came out and was was stopped by two two soldiers in kind of funny, funny uniforms. They were Swiss guards. They weren't in the ceremonial guard, but they said, they said, are you an American? And he said, yes. Well, the Pope would like to meet you. So we went up and spent five minutes with the Pope. And, and he told me this story and uh, personally, and it, it's a wonderful story. And uh, about 20 years ago, he was invited back to Italy and they displayed his uniform and this story uh, in, a, in a museum in, in Rome. So I know it's I know it's true. It's it's one of my favorite stories in the whole book. It's a it's a great story. The other one that mildly amused me is that um, through Mark Clark comes in to sort of accept the surrender, but there's no one to surrender the city, is there? No, <laughs> it kind of steals his thunder. Well, I'm not a fan of Mark Clark. Anyone who's who is and is listening to this will have to keep that in mind. Basically, he was pushing, pushing, pushing because he was one of the few allied soldiers at the time that knew that Normandy was going to go on the 6th of June. So on the 4th of June, he wanted to get into Rome. Basically, he wanted to have the headlines, Rome taken, you know, by his fifth army. Uh, Forget, by the way, the British Eighth Army. He didn't like Montgomery. Montgomery didn't like him. I'll let everybody else sort that out. My uncle went into Rome on the 4th, in the afternoon of the 4th, but the vast majority of of allied troops went in uh, the morning of the of the 5th. That's when the crowds erupted. So uh, Clark says, it's uh, it's time to go. We're going to go receive the surrender. And so he's running around and driving around this little convoy of Jeeps and nobody knows where they are. And and I thought, well, that's because they didn't have maps. But I've actually around here someplace got a, an actual World War II map of the city of Rome. So they had maps. Jeez, if you can read a map, you, you know where you are. Anyway, he ended up at the Vatican, stops and people say, oh, there's American General who is It's Clark. Monsignor O'Flaherty, the member of the escape line, uh, actually comes over and meets with him. There's a, uh, a picture. I don't know if I got it in the book or not, but there's a picture of Monsignor O'Flaherty meeting him. And he, and he says, well, well, where should I go to receive the surrender of the city? And O'Flaherty or someone said, well, you should go to City Hall. That would be the place. But well, they found a boy on a bicycle who said, follow me. And so... They they followed the they followed and went uh, and went to the Campidoglio. He marched up. The mayor of Rome was a fascist and had fled. Many in the city government were either staying home or fled. And so he uh, he looked around and said, oh, "Well, there's uh, there's nobody to." But I've called a meeting of my corps commanders and did a press conference. And, and that was that was vintage Mark Clark. What happens to Rome after the liberation? Because it's now under Allied control. It's once more occupied by somebody else. All the materials in the in the stockyards are going the other way, and, in, and you know they've got to, <laughs> and so that was that was important. At first, they thought that they were going to need to garrison the city of, of Rome, and and the U.S. Third Infantry Division was scheduled to do that. But after after just a few days, uh, the Pope and others said, you know, if you keep all these troops in there. All you're doing is enticing the, the Germans to bomb the city. Why don't you not do that? And so they thought that that was a good idea because they didn't want the infrastructure bombed. So they moved the, the garrison troops over and they, they put in, they were military police, of course, and they were humanitarian aides and American uh, uh, AMGOT, uh, uh, allied military government of Italy, people running around. The uh, biggest problem they had, of course, was they had to feed everybody because there was no, no food. So the Fifth Army supply people got together uh, with the Vatican and who had soup kitchens already and started to feed the population. And so that was really uh, that was really important. But they didn't really actually garrison garrison the city. A lot of the infrastructure of the city was, was run by the, the people that weren't fascist that stayed in place. They got the telephone up, the, the gas works going the electricity going. It's easy for me to say that, but it was quite difficult to get all these services back. The police, the Carabinieri took over. There was a fascist police group called the uh, Polizia Africana Italiano, the PAI, and uh, they worked worked for a while. They took off their Mussolini insignia and put on the Le Stelle, 
which which are stars, which is what the Italian military wears. So so they they kind of took over. But it was as far as the Allies go, you know, it was not a harsh occupation. The uh, hotels along the Via Veneto basically changed the sheets, and uh, the Germans had left. And twenty four hours later, the Americans came in, and uh, they kept the American officers separate from the American Air Force officers because they didn't want the pilots and getting in fights over stuff. Uh, the hotels all opened up, uh, clubs started, and it became an R and R center. And the people went about building their their lives. Uh, uh, but there were still thousands and thousands of refugees and and damaged infrastructure. And I don't want to make light of it, saying it was all it was all easy because it was it wasn't. But uh, considering uh, you know Warsaw and uh, Berlin and and Coventry and places like that that were destroyed, uh, Rome Rome escaped a lot of this. Yeah, yeah indeed. Well, th- thank you, Victor. I, I enjoyed that very much. Um, yeah, I, I, I love Rome as a city. <laughs> uh, loyal listener, if you want to know more, Victor's book is Rome City in Terror, the Nazi Occupation, 1943-44. If you're going to Rome, why not pick up a copy and take it with you? I'm sure it will make a great accompaniment to your trip to the city. I'll put a link to the book on the website. Don't forget, if you want a bit more World War II talk, why not become a patron of the podcast? You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Well, that's all for me for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.